Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Emily Bowe, the Assistant Director of the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. You're joining us today for our long-awaited program with Veronica O. Davis about her book, which we have copies of at the library, Inclusive Transportation, a Manifesto for Repairing Divided Communities, published this year by Island Press. Before we begin our program today, I wanna to take note of the complicated and contested threads that are woven through historical geography, including difficult stories that we neither can nor should ignore. The place that we now call Boston is the ancestral and current home to indigenous peoples. The Massachusetts people lived for thousands of years and still live today on the Shawmut Peninsula. The metropolitan region is also home to other tribes, including Mashpee and Aquinawampanog and the Nipmuc Nations. Copley Square, where the center is now located, sits atop a, tidal, a filled tidal estuary that once featured some of the most advanced marine agricultural techniques in North America. The maps that are in the Boston Public Library's collection bear witness not only to histories of cold, colonial expropriation, but also to conflicts ranging from labor struggles to racial segregation. In some cases, these maps don't simply document these stories, but actually played a role in making them happen in the first place. Throughout all of our programs and interpretation at the Leventhal Center, we encourage visitors to consider how these histories still exert real effects on the present day. Today's talk is part of our ongoing exhibition, Getting Around Town, Mapping Four Centuries of Boston in Transit. In Getting Around Town, which is free to visit six days a week in our gallery at the Central Library, we explore the long history of the transportation infrastructure in and around Boston. The many historic maps in the show depict colonial era ferry service, rapid expansion of the private railroad networks, the na nation's first subway here in Boston, the modernization of the T and unbuilt transit possibilities. Our team curators worked with our K-12 education team to create their own maps for the exhibition that in many cases highlight the uneven ways that trans transit benefits different residents. One of the things that's brought into sharp relief in exploring the exhibition is how Boston's modern transit systems are built upon the compounding choices, investments, mistakes, and beliefs of the past. And that it takes significant work to undo things that have been made physical with infrastructure, policy, and investment, or lack thereof. The giant floor map that greets you as you physically enter our gallery explores these inequalities that persist in the geography of who has access to a reliable, affordable, and well-connected transportation network. Entitled How We Get Around Today, the map attempts to put ridership, commuting, and income data in conversation with each other to better understand the ways our current system doesn't work for all residents. But as our speaker tonight points out in her book, data is a starting point, but certainly not the place to end the conversation. In today's talk, we're gonna hear more about what it means to engage directly with the processes that shape our transportation ecosystem in order to further inclusivity and repair that ecosystem. So now I'll go ahead and welcome Veronica O. Davis to the screen as I briefly introduce her. Veronica is a civil engineer, planner, self-described transit ner transportation nerd, uh, public speaker, community activist, guest, guest lecturer, poet, blogger, lover of art, yogi, foodie, world explorer, wife, and mom. In her bio, she notes that at 22 years old, she wrote a life strategic plan declaring that she would be a world-renowned transportation expert and an author with an eclectic collection of books across multiple genres. We're excited to be here to help bring that into reality by getting to talk about your book today. So welcome, Veronica. <laughs> Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Uh, and I am excited to talk about my book. Um, I will say exclusive for just for this presentation. So if some of you have seen me before, um, some elements will look the same, um, but because we are talking about maps, uh, I do have more maps in this presentation that aren't in the book. Um, but I am very excited to have this conversation today. Awesome, well, we're thrilled to see it. And just as a note for the audience, uh, feel free to put questions or comments in the chat throughout the talk, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook. Um, we'll have time for a Q&A at the end, so we'd love to hear from you. And with that, I will turn it over officially to Veronica. Awesome. All right. So inclusive transportation. Um, one of the things, I know this is just my opening slide, 
Um, but I want to give a lot of kudos uh, to Martin Schmall, who is the designer of the cover. Um, and this is a little exploded pieces of the cover. But what's so great about this, um, it's an intersection of what inclusive transportation could be like. It is different people being represented, different modes being represented, and there's no buildings to distract of where is this, where could this be? To really say this could be the vision anywhere if we have the vision. Um, but I do have my social medias on here. So as long as Twitter or X or whatever it's called now is still around, um, my social media is at Veronica O. Davis. And then my personal website is veronicao.com. Um, just to um, frame the book for you, for those of you that haven't had a chance uh, to read it, um, this is just the table of contents. Uh, the foreword is by Tamika Butler. Um, she is She goes by pronouns she and they a really um, great thinker in the transportation planning space. Uh, one of the people who fell into it from the advocacy world and is now in a PhD program learning more, uh, but a person I consider part of my brain and heart trust. And so it was an honor for her to write the forward. The preface, I talk a little bit about the writing experience and the questioning of myself. I think there's always self doubt for any of us of, am I the expert? Um, does my expertise matter? Does someone have to bless me as the expert? But it was the recognition of even though I've read books by others, who's to say they are the expert? These are my personal and my professional experiences that I put in there. So I talk a little bit about that in the preface. In the introduction, I know that there's many people listening today that are going to come at this from different backgrounds. So in the introduction, I attempt to set the framework, which I'll do a little bit here tonight, about the transportation industry, of how we do our plans, how we built our system, why things seem to take so long, um, how we make different decisions and how those decisions continue to harm individuals. Um, and I frame that just for people who may not be familiar to be able to just have that, that basic understanding. So the six main chapters, um, big picture, they're all structured where I provide some thoughts, I provide case studies, but then I also provide opportunities as a reader to reflect. So whether you are in the transportation industry or you are a armchair engineer, um, it really is for you to be able to read and then have an opportunity to reflect a book that people could come back to. And so in chapter one, I talk about transportation as personal. I will share some of that today with some maps and the impact that the transportation industry has had on me as a person. Um, as well as my family. Um, then I get into the equity and that whole discussion. And spoiler alert, I don't actually really define equity, um, but I just give frameworks uh, for people to understand what equity means for your community. In chapter three, should there be a war on cars? I don't know, should there? Um, chapter four is power, influence, and the complexity of people. And that's where I talk about different types of stakeholders, the people who have power, um, similar to my day job, um, the people who um, are the champions of the project, the people who may be the naysayers of the project. And then what's really most important are the silently suffering, the group of people that we really should be centering in the work that we do. In chapter five, I talk about bringing it all together in terms of the public engagement process and the technical process. And then I end with the call to action. So again, tonight, I will focus a little bit on the introduction just to provide a framework for how and why we make decisions in the transportation industry. Um, I will talk about transportation as personal. I will share my family's story. There will be lots of maps. And then I will end with the call to action. And that's really just to provide a vision for what things could be if we were, just make, if we were to just make different decisions. So how we designed our systems. Um, so I'm gonna start off. Um, I know that we had a really great introduction from Emily that framed uh, some of what is going on in the Boston area, but that is going on nationwide. But I'm gonna start off with this quote, um, James True's Low Adams. So this is, when I was doing research about the American dream, this is really one of the first uh, definitions and mentions that I was able to find of the American dream. And what the quote says is, life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. This is a really great statement. I think all of us would agree with this type of statement. 
But what's really important is the year that this statement was made. This is 1931. Uh, so this is, we are in the peak of Jim Crow. And while people associate Jim Crow with the South, it was really across the United States. You had redlining, um, which is, um, for those of you that may not know what redlining is, um, there's a really great book called Color of Love, Color of Law, excuse me. And so redlining was different things like deeds, protective covenants, the real estate industry, intentionally encouraging some people to live in some communities and other people to live in different communities. And what's very important about understanding redlining, I think it's very easy, particularly because I am a black woman sitting in front of you, to think about this in black or white terms. But this is 1931. And in 1931, people who were Irish, people who were Jewish, people who were Italian were not considered white. And so there are oftentimes protective covenants on properties that even exist today. While they're not enforceable, they're still there. Um, and it might be on deeds uh, or what have you. But you will see Irish, Italian, Jewish. So they were not allowed to live in certain neighborhoods. So it wasn't just about Black people or, or in this time frame. It could be colored. It could be Negro. It just wasn't about those groups. The definition of white was very specific. And so this is important. So as you think about the American dream, so this is a screenshot from my laptop and I just typed in American dream ads. And what you see, it's all different types of colorful ads. Usually it is a man and a woman with a son, a daughter, a cat, maybe a dog, a house, a car. And so the American dream was really about suburbanization. It was about uh, creating uh, something for people. What's very key about the American dream is our federal government funded some of it. Um, and so as people came back from war, uh, mostly white soldiers were given access to be able to live in communities called Levitt towns um, and be able to get access to housing out in the suburbs. And so it created this need for suburbanization. And um, the interesting thing about this, as you look at all of the American dream ad photos, there's one that sticks out. And that's this photo. This is the one photo that has people um, who are different, who are people of color. And it's mostly black people, Italians that are standing in this food line. This is from 1937. And there's this juxtaposition of people standing in this food line with the backdrop of world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. And you see this family, um, a white man, a white woman, their two children, their dog in their vehicle. And so that is the dream that we should all aspire to. And so what happened is you have this happening in the 1930s and you lead into the 40s and 50s. It, you then begin to see what were dense inner city neighborhoods basically destroyed in order to facilitate people to be able to leave in these idyllic places and still be able to drive into downtown for work. So now we get to some maps. Uh, this is a map of uh, 1960 of East Baton Rouge in Louisiana. This is where my family is from. My mother's side of the family is from. And I know it's a little bit faded, but it's from 1960. Um, and so what you see are parcel maps that designate different parcels um, within East Baton Rouge at that particular time. In some cases there is ownership, particularly for some of the more commercial properties and very fainted on top, it's kind of like this shaded um, area. And so what that was were engineers, planners at the time, all white men were trying to decide how they were going to um, do the route for Interstate 10, which is the expressway that connects Florida to California today. And so they were trying to figure this all out at this particular time. And this is the map. <clears throat> excuse me, this is the map of that particular uh, era where they were doing the planning. Um, this community during this particular time was mostly black and Italian. So my next slide is a zoom in and I have an arrow. So the arrow pointing to the north, that parcel, um, so it's, it's one big parcel, but the front arrow, that's where the house of my great grandmother, uh, my grandfather's mother, and the arrow pointing to the east, that was my grandparents' house. And it wasn't just my grandparents' house, that was my mother's house as well. So when my mom was in high school, 
um, her house was taken and was there compensation? Sure, probably, maybe. I was not able to find evidence of that. And unfortunately, uh, neither of my grandparents are no longer living. But my, um, my mom's family was, they relocated to a different part of Baton Rouge. And I'll share some of that a little bit later. Um, but my great grandmother's house was still there. And so my mom, I was in high school. She was the last graduating class from St. Francis Xavier High School. Um, which had to be rebuilt, but it was basically demolished in order to build uh, the interstate. And so you'll hear stories and sometimes see interstates even within your own communities. And it's easy to feel like this happened so long ago. But my mother is very much, much still in her right mind, although she has her moments, um, but she's still very much in her right mind. And the fact that she can recall this with so much clarity from my book, I also interviewed my uncle, and he shared stories of um, that transition from living in this community to moving in a different community, um, as well as there's like this family story um, that at one point cows like fell off the highway into my great grandmother's backyard. Um, but the other part of this story is I, as a child, remembered going to visit my grandmother whose house was underneath the freeway. And so um, when I was probably around eight or nine, my family sold the house to the next door convenience store um, and then had it demolished and my great grandmother moved in with my grandparents. So even in my lifetime, I remember my grandmother's house underneath the freeway. And so here is a side by side. Uh, the photo on the left is provided by my mom. Um, this is from uh, when my, my family was living there. So that is my uncle standing in the front. And so the address was 961 Myrtle Avenue. Uh, the street has since been renamed. I think it's Myrtle Trail or something of that nature. The photo on the right is what exists today. Um, so where you see right before the tree, um, that is where my great grandmother's house was. And the tree was in the backyard or in the side yard ish. And then in the back, you see a pillar of the highway, and that's where my grandparents' house was. And you know, there are communities today that remember what this is. And so as we talk about harms, communities that have been harmed over and over again. And one of the, I won't say insults, but an attempt to undo the harm is the parcel now is actually called the Expressway Park. So this park was in place to then reconnect the community and re -knit. Um, but the challenge is you're trying to re-knit people who aren't even there anymore. Um, so this is another slide, uh, very hard to read, but again, a map of the 1950s. So this was before the planning, um, just to show what East Baton Rouge looked like. And you had a really great grid network. And so for those of us in the transportation industry, grid networks are awesome for people who are walking um, and for people who are biking. However, um, what you see today is that grid has really been disrupted by this expressway. Um, you see a lot of the houses have been since torn down. Um, the property that is right at the bend of the curve of I-10, so that's, uh, that's, the, that's the block that my family had lived on. And so we've changed the community. Um, we've changed the way communities uh, access and then look at things. And what the other part of this story is, as we talk about transportation, so now we've made it so that someone in the suburbs can easily get out of downtown Baton Rouge in order to get home. It facilitates this movement. It facilitates interstate goods movement as well. Um, but from a family perspective, um, so you see on this map where it says St. Francis Xavier Church. So that was the church that my family attended, and that was the high school that my mom attended. And it was walking distance. It was about a five-minute walk from home to church. Um, and that is still very much my family's church um, that live in Baton Rouge. But the next slide is, um, so this is where my family relocated to. So what was a five minute walk to church then became now an 11 minute drive. And frankly, um, when I did this map, it was probably late at night, but it's probably more like a 20, 30 minute drive. So what we've now done is we forced people to have to have a vehicle to make a trip that they didn't have to do before. And many communities face the same thing. And the problem is car ownership is very expensive. Even the used car ownership is very expensive because you have the car itself, whether you have a car note, you have the insurance, you have gas, you have maintenance, all of those things cost money. 
And so this is the impact and many communities are feeling the same type of impact where they have been displaced, but they're still trying to go back to the things that feel familiar. And I'm sure you experienced this in Boston as well, where families have been displaced, but they still go back to that church that their family has attended for generations and generations, or they go back to that synagogue, or they go back to the mosque, that place of worship that has been the center or pillar of that community. So no matter how far they are, they're still going there, but it's requiring driving. And so the overall impact of all of this is now that we've built all of these wide roads. Um, we have a thing in transportation called the high injury network. And so it, and that and that is generally um, the roads where people are dying or people are having uh, serious injuries. And that's called the high injury network. Typically those roads um, are gonna be eight lanes, six lanes, um, and generally through these types of communities um, that are the bypass communities that I'm just trying to get through to get somewhere else. And so the impact, this is from uh, the coalition of uh, Complete Streets. I'm sorry, Complete Streets Coalition, said that wrong, um, where they put out every other year, every even year, they put out a um, report. It's called Dangerous by Design. Unfortunately, it hasn't changed much. And unfortunately, more people are dying. But this is just looking at pedestrian deaths per, per uh, 100,000 people by race and ethnicity in this country. And so you see Black and Native American are overrepresented in the number of deaths. And part of that is largely living in communities that are those communities where people are trying to get out to get to the suburbs. And so we've created these very dangerous places. And I do have a picture a little bit later that will drive this a little bit home. And so then where do we go from here? Um, so as I mentioned, so this is a typical road of what I'm talking about. And I know that this, this exists anywhere. So this happens to be uh, Maryland, um, but this literally could be anywhere. And it's a road that it has a wide sidewalk. So it's to encourage walking. You have six lanes each, you know, uh, of traffic. You have turn lanes, and so while I can walk across the sh uh, um, up the street, it makes it very difficult to cross. This is even what we would call a complete street because it does have transit. But what tends to happen is there are transit stops, and people, being people, are going to go the path of least resistance. That bus is showing up, and what people do is dash across the street in order to catch that bus. And that is usually where they will be struck and they will be killed. And in the newspaper in the next day, the write-up will say, um, you know, XX person uh, died yesterday and they were not in a crosswalk. And so there's a very much a victim blaming. And we could say they weren't in the crosswalk, but generally in situations in roads like this, um, people have to walk a half a mile out of the way just to get to a crosswalk to walk a half a mile back. No one is gonna do that when the bus is coming. And so it's understanding that we have to plan better roads. We have to think not just about what we call the cross section, but also think about how people move across our roadways. And so there are better ways. And so I'm gonna share some pictures of some of my travels to give a vision of what things could be with the right leadership in our cities um, to be able to fund these type of projects. Um, but before I go there, uh, so this is a picture from the Jetsons. And um, I have this because I think sometimes our politicians can be seduced uh, by technology. And so they think technology is going to save us. And so while electric vehicles may make the air cleaner in the city, the energy still has to come from somewhere. And while autonomous vehicles have promised to make us safer, really what it's going to come down to is moving traffic more efficiently but it doesn't get us to a better vision for the future. This is a photo from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and I know a lot of times when people think about Amsterdam, they think about biking. And when I went there, I actually didn't bike despite the fact that I love biking because I was just so amazed by the transit. It was the quality of the transit, the cleanliness of the transit, the ease of use without even knowing, I don't speak a lick of Dutch, so we're crystal clear. I could barely read it. And um, it was very interesting to be able to navigate public transit in a city where the, I did not have that as a primary language. There was a lot of symbols, there's a lot of icons, and I was able to move and navigate around the city with ease. And even with the transfer between different uh, lines, it was very seamless. And even in 
you know, eight o'clock or nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night in the middle of the week, um, this public transit was still operating at about five minutes in between trains. So I wasn't outside unsure of when the next one was going to come. And it was a very good experience. And I know that sometimes we look at the Netherlands and say, well, that's the Netherlands. But in 1970s, uh, Netherlands looked like many of our U.S. cities, very car centric with vehicle traffic. But they made the decision to do something different and be different. And here's another example from the Netherlands. Um, so again, this is a very wide street. This street is probably about as wide as most US cities, um, but they have a place for everyone. In the center, there is a place for transit. Um, you have um, a place for cars to drive. So it's not about being anti-car, but it's about giving people other options and giving people as many options so that they can choose how to move. There is a bike lane, um, noticing the different colors of materials where people are able to bike and then a nice wide sock, sidewalk for people to be able to walk. On the other side of the street, there is parking. So it really has accommodated everyone. The challenge is this type of vision scares people because we're so scared of traffic. But part of it is the more options we can give people, the more that people will make different decisions and some will still choose to drive and that's okay. Um, this is one of my favorite cities in Colombia. It's called Cali, Colombia. And I know a lot of people talk about Bogota and um, what Enrique Pinalosa did as mayor of Bogota to really transform that area. Um, but really what I love about Cali is in the United States, we pat ourselves on the back because we have a bus only uh, lane. And we're like, we did it. We have a bus only lane. But in Cali, Colombia, with a right of way, Pretty much, again, similar to some of the right of ways you'll see in urban areas within the United States, they have a bus only street. And so what's amazing about this is the vibrancy of this street, um, the fact that there are multiple lines that can come in and out and move efficiently. Um, what you don't see, and I'm, I'm really mad at myself for not getting a picture. So there is a transit station, but on the other side of the transit station is this really great kind of flea market outdoor vendors. And so that is what they've defined as transit-oriented development. So while you have these higher rise buildings, and that's what we consider transit-oriented development, they have this other type of development or other type of economic activity that is happening around the stations that is very authentic and very awesome. So you get off the bus and get your fresh mango and then walk um, you know, onto wherever you are going next. But these are the type of uh, visions that we could have here in the United States with a little bit of boldness to them. And then lastly, um, here's an example from Brussels and Belgium. Uh, Bel Brussels is my sleeper European city and a lot of people love Paris. But what I love about Brussels is the fact that they said, nope, we're just gonna make the whole street just for people. And so the vibrancy of this, and this picture is taken in the middle of a work day. And so the fact that people can move and be safe and actually take the time to window shop. And what's really interesting about this particular section of uh, Brussels for me is how quiet it is without the vehicles. Um, and that is a way to have vibrancy in different areas. So that's part of what I talk about at the end of the book is having bold leadership. And it takes time, but to get there, we have to have the vision for what our downtowns could be. Because the more options, again, that we give people, the more options that they have, and it, they don't have to own a car, which is such an expense for many people. Um, so with that, again, my name is Veronica Davis, on my social media, my personal website, and I know we will have some Q&A. Thank you so much. Thanks, Veronica. That was really, I, we are very grateful for having all of the extra maps in the in the presentation. This is a map loving uh, crowd. So um, very much appreciate that. Um, I'm going to kick us off with a question, but for everyone in the audience, um, even if you have not read the book, which I assume most of you have not, but you should after this, um, feel free to add questions in the chat and then we'll go from there. Um, so one of the things I wanted to with you about was uh, one whole chapter of the book is kind of, um, you know, you you kind of pick apart the idea of like what a stakeholder is, but one whole chapter of the book is effectively um, kind of thinking through 
power and how people are able to uh, shape a, a policy situation and kind of an unpacking this kind of stakeholder analysis. So I guess one question for an audience that has not read yet read the book, but will mm -hmm. after this, what would you say are the kind of key pieces of um, kind of tactical advice for folks that are wanting to sort of engage in these conversations critically, um, but also have have kind of thoughtful ways of of understanding politics and budgets and all kinds of stuff that I know you deal with on a day to day basis. Right. So I will say at the very uh, practical level, it's um, start small. I think the thing about this transportation world, it's like the the rabbit hole uh, in Alice in Wonderland and it can go very deep. Um, so I will say start small for people um, that are trying to engage in this. Um, it could literally be as as small as you take a walk around your neighborhood and you submit 311 requests for things that need to be fixed in your neighborhood, whether it's a pothole, whether it's signs, whether it's graffiti. And it's such a like minor thing, but it's very important. If you see faded crosswalks, and I know that um, your uh, city department of transportation is gonna be really mad at me for saying this, but that is a way to engage because all of those things, um, crosswalks are extremely important to safety. Um, and so it's alerting the city to let them know that, hey, this needs to be fixed in my neighborhood. That is at the very like small level. At a bigger level, it is as there are projects that are coming to your community, making sure to attend a public meeting. If you can't attend the public meeting on your own time, look at the materials, submit questions. If there's a survey, always fill out the survey. Even if you support the project, always fill out the survey. When you really support the project, send an email and it can be as simple as I support the project because what tends to happen is for many people is the average citizen is just trying to survive. We're just trying to get home from work. Um, some people may be working two jobs. People are trying to get food on the table for their kids. People are just trying to survive. And what happens when I talk about power, there's two particular groups that always show up to public meetings. And those are the, what I call the naysayers and what I call the champions. And the naysayers are people that are going to be against the project. And some people may be against it with concerns that are, that are, um, that are I won't say valid because I don't want to invalidate anybody's concerns. But, you know, there are people who may have concerns that are very specific that could be addressed. And there's people that don't want the project regardless. It doesn't really matter what you do, what you say. They are perfectly fine with everything the way they are and they are never gonna want anything that you propose. Those are the naysayers. And then I have the champions. Those are the people that are like, nah, I love this project, it's the greatest thing in the world. It could be an advocacy group that um, is really supportive of this. And sometimes uh, what happens with the champions, love them. Um, but you know, sometimes with the champions, they can get overzealous and don't aren't willing to compromise. And so anytime there's a public meeting, and I know that there's one coming up at the library soon, Anytime there's a public meeting, I don't care what community it is, you can pretty much guarantee is going to show up. Every planner, every engineer knows exactly who's going to show up. And it's going to be people from those groups, the, the, the very specific people, the same 50 people. And so what happens is there's all these others that have ideas that may like a project that may say, OK, I'm concerned, but I could get through it. But I just want to bring this to your attention. They're often unheard. And specifically, I talk about the silently suffering. And those are the people that are like the communities where people are dying. And they really don't have time to go to meetings because they're working two, three shifts. They are, they are in struggle mode. And when you're trying to figure out how I'm going to feed my family or how I'm going to pay for groceries, I'm not even thinking about your meeting. Or I guess I ride the bus. I'd love to make it better. I don't even have time to think about how to make it better. Just want to show up on time. And so... You have all of that. So I think therefore it's important for those of you that haven't engaged in this, it is take the time to attend a public meeting if you're able to, or again, um, reading the materials. And for those of you that really wanna like jump all the way in, if you're like, oh, I read this and I have a renewed passion. Uh, I saw the pictures of Cali Columbia and I want that. You know, you could really get in this and there are all types of ways to get engaged. There's usually advisory boards. Every city has a bicycle advisory council a pedestrian advisory council, one for disabilities as people move around cities with different types of disabilities, not just people in wheelchairs, people that may have cognitive disabilities, sensory challenges as they're moving through um, a city. So considering all of that, 
Um, then there's regional, like you can get as deep into this world as you want. But I think that the most important is, is just showing up and making sure to provide your voice. Yeah. And I'll ask one more question before we move on. We've got a couple questions in the chat. Um, in the book, you talk a little bit about, you have an anecdote about uh, the rollout of two different bike share systems, one in DC and one in Philly. And um, you kind of talk about how those rollouts differed, but you have a quote that says both DC and Philly systems considered equity, but one focused on place and the other focused on people. Um, so for the benefit of the audience, will you kind of briefly unpack what that means, but also talk a little bit more about um, the kind of the tools to focus on people as, as a kind of path towards transportation equity? Okay. So starting with the DC and the focus on place, um, what planners love to do is pull up a Google map and like, or pull up Esri and GIS and do all the analysis. And we come up with frameworks that say, okay, we want to locate a bike share station, X amount of whatever from a school or from a transit or from this. And so we've like crunch all the numbers and GIS tells us where we should put this. And we say, oh, great. We have where we should put this. And then we layer demographics on top of it. And we like pat ourselves on the back because we did a really good job. We might even go out on site. And we look at the, the, the physical corner and we're like, okay, let me measure. Okay. Yeah. we got enough right away here. And we plop them down. And so that was essentially DC's approach. And there's nothing wrong with it. It was very, there was a method, a methodology to it. Um, they did take into account equity to make sure that there were bike shares that existed in a uh, black communities, um, lower income communities. And um, yeah, so that's one approach. Um, but the challenge is it's uh, the ridership wasn't there because what happened is one day people go to work and next, thing you know, these red bicycles are just sitting on the corner. And so everyone's like, okay, but what do I do with this? And then it spurred this conversation on gentrification of, well, this must be for someone else because I don't, obviously not for me because I don't know how to use it. Um, and so you ended up having, um, you know, that type of, of conversation around the DC program. When you look at how Philly did it, so Philly had the benefit of not being the first city. By the time that Philly was designing their program, uh, DC's was up and functional. New York City's was operational. A um, couple others, I think maybe Chicago's might have been operational. So they had the benefit of having other people that had been at least operating a, a year or two or three um, and the lessons learned. And so what Philly did was they came at it a completely different. So before they opened up their maps, I know we love maps, but before they opened up their maps, they started with people. And so they worked with Temple University and they had a lot of focus groups in different neighborhoods. And they brought very intentional people um, together, paid them for their time, very important. So they paid them for their time and brought them together and asked them different types of questions from what color should the bike be? different names, like how do you feel about this name? How do you think this should operate? So the interesting thing about the Philly, oh, oh, and then like what else should happen? And so based on that feedback, that's where they got, there needs to be a cash option. So for all the other systems, they were based on credit card. So if you were, um, you know, a person and what happens with a lot of, uh, with, I'm not gonna say a lot, I wanna generalize, but what happens, what tends to happen with some populations is that they don't have a credit card or they are what's considered unbanked. Um, and so they didn't have a way to access. And if I don't have a card, if I don't have a debit card, how do I access or use this bike? Um, but Philly said, okay, so we're going to have, we have to figure out a cash way to do this. Um, so that was number one. Two, um, what they heard was um, the fact that they wanted to see job creation for people in the community. And so Philly's like, okay, great. So they created, they, they hired brand ambassadors and that was people from the community to be brand ambassadors, to sit at different stations, to help people figure out how to use it, to explain the program, to show how it you you know how they used it and all of that. Um, so what you had is a system that by the time it rolled out, there was a cash option. So they were the first to figure out cash, and they worked with different um, stores like Seven Eleven and others um, to be able to facilitate. Um, someone being able to pot by their time. So one, they figured out the cash situation. And then two, they had job creation for people in the community. And so the reception around their bike share was just a lot different because of that. And so that's when places, I just pull up a map 
and I do my methodology, people is, hey, person, I'm coming into your community. This is what this program is. How best can this system serve your community? Um, how can it be a tool for your community? And so in doing that at the beginning and really centering on people, they were able to build um, a very successful bike share program. Yeah, I love that anecdote mostly because obviously we we rely lots on maps in our in at least in, in my day job. We do that a lot. We are the map, but I appreciated the way that uh, that anecdote kind of highlighted um, the real limitations of GIS analysis and of kind of a database approach. And those kinds of things really need to be paired with other kinds of um, information that can be used to inform any kind of process like that. So it was, it was a very, I, I chuckled at that one when I saw the, the GIS part. Um, <laughs> so, okay, we've got a couple questions. Uh, first I'll go to Sheldon's question. Um, and Sheldon writes, what opinion how, do you have on the walkable city or 15 minute city concept? Um, so I think walkable cities are extremely important. Um, and this is where a challenge that many cities face is transportation and housing are siloed and they're not thought about together. And so what tends to happen is if you make a community more walkable without being intentional around the housing, you've made a community more desirable, which means that property values are going to go out and unfortunately people are going to be displaced. Um, so that, that is what tends to happen. And then as you think about the 15 minute city, this is where it's very important to, um, not always come at it from a economic lens in the sense that, uh, when people think about mixed use development, it's a very specific thing. It is going to be a building with retail at the bottom some housing on top of that nature. And typically that retail is going to be a national chain or the um, kind of higher end type of retail. So it's not just gonna be a mom and pop coffee shop, it's gonna be you know the, the coffee shop with the accoutrements. So I say all that to say, I think that to truly have a good 15 minute city is you have to consider people I'm always going to say people, you have to consider people, you have to have the transportation, the housing and your economic people come together so that you can create cities where or, or communities where people can walk to what they need. And it's not just always getting a cup of coffee. It is getting to the doctor, getting to the dentist, um, getting to the grocery store. Um, that is where a lot of communities, I've seen a lot of walkable communities and you can't even get groceries. Um, so getting to the grocery store to be able to meet your basic needs, all of those things become important, but also it becomes important to take into account the context of that community so that you're not um, creating gentrification or creating something that that community is unable to enjoy. There's, some, there's, there's sometimes this grittiness in mom and pop, right? There's that culture that comes with mom and pop shops. So I think it could be there, but you have to have really good policies to make sure that it is done in a way that respects existing communities and provides an, an avenue for them to be able to stay in their community. Yeah. Um, we'll go to the next question from Pangloss Lake. The map of Baton Rouge was a great sad example of bad transportation policy from the 20th century. Are there any maps of cities from around that time that show projects that were good examples? Not really. Um, I think as you look at most cities, um, there there is, um, I know Streets Blog has done it and um, Smart Growth America, where there's a lot of blogs that have actually documented major cities in the United States and what they looked like before and after the highway. Um, there, the, I actually cannot think of a major city in the United States that didn't have this type of displacement and destruction for the highways. Um, everyone has, and it may not have been certain communities, but pretty much black, brown, low income communities um, have been impacted. And, and again, it's, it's very well documented. I actually even have some citations in my book so there really aren't any good examples of where someone did a highway during this time and we can pat ourselves on the back and say they did a good job. But what I will say is there are examples of, even in Boston, 
Um, there are examples of communities that were able to galvanize together, um, even low-income communities that were able to really to galvanize and fight um, the expansion of highways or fight certain things. So looking at the District of Columbia, for example, um, they actually have the map of the what the original interstate was supposed to look like. And you see the remnants of that in the city. There's like one part of the city where they have uh, these clover leaves. So you see the remnants of what was supposed to be a highway that never got built, but that was because communities stopped them. And so now the city is working to remove some of those clover leaves and um, those remnants of the old highways. Um, there are examples I know in Boston, I forgot the neighborhood, um, but it's the one by the train station where it was supposed to be a highway and the community rose up and said, nope, not here. Yep. Um, and so you do have examples of that, but in terms of the highway, I don't know a single example of a highway that didn't have destruction during that particular time period. Have we gotten better? Maybe. Um, some places maybe better than others. Um, you see a lot of capping of highways, so I won't bring up the big dig because <laughs> a lot that comes up with that. Uh, but it is an example of you know capping and hiding um, what we did when building these um, you know this big infrastructure through communities. Yeah, and I th the project you're referring to is now the Southwest Corridor um, that runs through a couple different neighborhoods in the city. But there's a great book that's by Dr. Carolyn Crockett that's called People, Bef uh, People Before Highways that details a lot of the kind of activism you're referencing. Um, so if you are if you are in and around Boston and you don't know the story of the uh, inner inner belt highway that almost was and the Orange Line moving and the Southwest Corridor, uh, be sure to check out that book. Um, we've got one other question from Rory uh, O'Connor. A lot of the concerns around trying to solve these transit issues in cities focus on the cost of reorganizing streets, loss of parking spaces, et cetera. What are some examples you've found in your travels and research that illustrate low cost or low impact implementation for better transit systems? Um, so honestly, bus lanes aren't really all that expensive. Um, I think what makes transit projects expensive is um, having to convince a lot of people that this should be a good transit project. I mean, and if I'm being frank, that is what really begins to increase the cost of transit projects. It's, and this is everywhere, of uh, there is um, an emotion that is attached to transit projects. Um, and I'm just, even whether it's a bus, a light rail, there's an emotion attached to it. Obviously, light rails are going to be more expensive, but even just the bus, um, there is a perception of who uses the bus. Um, and, you know, buses are very scary things and I would never use the bus. So therefore, I don't want to necessarily do anything to make the buses better. And so um, transit projects are actually pretty low cost. Um, I will share in the city of Houston, we just did a, a bus lane project on two of our downtown streets. It was a five lane road, uh, sing, you know, a one way street that is extremely dangerous. So we use one lane is a bus only lane all day. Um, the second lane that we uh, borrowed is a, a high occupancy vehicle lane during the peak and people and, they're, and it's bright red um, and people are respecting it. And we're not necessarily any, seeing any more traffic in the other lanes um, than, than anticipated but it's just an example of we were able to get it done, but for leadership, but for support. And it really wasn't an expensive project to implement. Um, what makes things expensive? You try to take away parking and hell have no fury, like a community about to lose some parking. Uh, and I share in the book a story we were laughing a little earlier. I found out the hard way that the DC library has their own police department because they shut down my public meeting. <laughs> um, and in that case, we weren't going to lose parking, but it, 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 it is emotional for people of, I need to be able to park right up against uh, where I need to be. So all that to say, um, transit projects can actually be done pretty efficiently. It's just getting it there, getting people to champion it, getting the elected officials and leadership to champion those things, what makes it hard. The other part of uh, transit, I will say, and I know the industry is really kind of grappling with this, especially as we come, especially as we come out of the pandemic side of COVID uh, and move into the endemic side. Um, but 
COVID taught us a lot. And so I know that all of us remember um, that as this, everything shut down in the downtowns, transit shut down as well because there was no need to take people in and out of downtown. And even after people are coming back to work, we're not quite seeing the ridership to downtowns um, the way it used to be because of hybrid schedules. Some people still working from home. Some people still just aren't comfortable with transit. But one of the interesting things with the data is actually showing us is while the ridership to downtown isn't increasing, you are seeing ridership numbers, neighborhood to neighborhood, actually increasing above pre-COVID levels. And so with that, it has to get back to a different mindset of, are we just gonna design a transit system that gets people from outside, from the suburbs to the outer areas into downtown, or are we gonna take this opportunity to actually connect neighborhoods with transit? And I know that uh, many of the research institutions right now are looking at that. Uh, many transit agencies are grappling with that of what does the next transit system need to look like? Because we can't keep doing, we keep saying going back to normal, this is our normal. We're not going back to what something was. So in our new normal, how do we move forward? And many people are looking at that and having some success at thinking about those neighborhood connections in order for transit to still be uh, viable um, and be an option for people. Yeah, well, and I mean, to like, it seems like as we're moving into that space, the kind of testing out new ideas for what, for, for things that might be useful in this kind of newer context feels like it may be one of the challenges, I guess, of the post-pandemic transit planning era. And you were mentioning earlier the kind of high costs of getting people on board with things. Um, there's a book you reference in the in your book that was, I think, came out a couple years ago that's by uh, Jeanette City Khan and Seth uh, Solomonov. It's Street Fight, um, mm -hmm. and it kind of details some of the uh, transportation kind of rollouts in New York under the Bloomberg administration. And uh, I, re I read that book a few years ago and one of the things I remember her writing about was uh, that kind of like, let's test it. Let's like, let's do a prototype. Let's test it and collect data and see, get get feedback from people. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious about your kind of thoughts on that kind of approach of the light, fast, quick, let's test it, um, kind of when you're trying to also bring in questions of inclusivity and equity and how do you do that? So that's kind of a curveball, but. Oh, no, absolutely. So in um, chapter six, uh, that is one of the first calls to action I have is we have to do things quicker. So for those of you that don't live in the transportation world, these things take a long time. So generally there is by, by, by uh, federal law, a metropolitan planning organization is required to have a long range plan. And usually it's going to be 20 to 30 years, likely on the 30 years. So think about how old you are today and add 30 to that. So that is the plan that is to be realized. That's how far out we are planning and thinking about the funding for the region. Um, so that one, that's a long time. So even with cities, as you have a long range plan for the city that feeds into that regional plan, Again, that's 30. We don't know what's going 30 years ago. We didn't know that from our phone, we could call our mom and like, look at, look at our mom. Right. So think about what 30 years is to come from now. So it's a long process. Then on top of that, you know, once you have your long range process, you may have your shorter program, which is your transportation improvement program. And that's generally going to be six years. Six years is still a long time. In six years, I will have a 10 year old. That is a long time. And, you know, and if you think about it, so then to get to something in the tip, you have to have a plan first. So the, the transportation improvement program that exists today was planned 10, 20 years ago. So I go out, you get the community engaged. They're like, OK, great. Sure. Let's do the project. You finally get it in the transportation improvement program so that you can get the design done. OK, now it's time for construction and the whole new community has moved in and you're almost starting from scratch. So it's a very long time. And for a lot of people, it's like, okay, so when are we gonna get this thing? So all that to say that I am very much team, I love calling something a pilot. Um, of let's just try it out, let's just try it out. Let's see what happens. If it doesn't work, we'll take it out. Um, and so we, I know that as a consultant, even in my role now, I've done things with just uh, plastic delineators, a little concrete curbs, we do that all the time, um, you know, or sometimes we try to just do stuff quietly and 
hope nobody notices. And <laughs> um, so I am very much team pilot so that we can have an understanding of, is this going to work? Is this going to change things? I'll give one uh, very tangible example of we had a intersection where it's two streets that has signalized intersections and traffic was backing up. So what we actually just did a pilot with the community of let's just put both of these signals on red flash and let's see what happens. And so we did, and we did that to simulate a, a four, four way stop sign. And so, and then, you know, we let some time go by and evaluate it. And so with one of the signals, we actually ended up turning it back on uh, for a variety of different reasons. And the other one, it was, eh, we don't really need it. So we're in the process of now thinking about removing it, but before just going in and removing it, it gives you an opportunity to test. So I'm very much team pilot um, and doing what we need to do to just test things out. I think even as you look at cities around and not to go back to COVID, but it was a great example of pilots that have become permanent. So what was once a parking space for one, maybe two cars that maybe made you, you know, $5 an hour. I don't know how much parking is now, but, you know, maybe made you $5 an hour uh, for the parking is now a restaurant that has, you know, tables for, you know, 10 tables that can accommodate four people per table. So that's 40 people eating every hour and the amount of economics that that is generating. And so many of those that popped up because of COVID are still there. Um, many are trying to then make them look a little bit nicer. So that's just an example of how pilots can be great to show people. I know nobody wants to lose that parking, but look at this really great place that you get where you can sit outside and you can eat, whether you have concerns or not, or even as you go through in the winter, okay, we'll throw some heat in there. You know, it, that is some, that is a really great example. And, and we did the same thing here where we sh took actually to shut down a road right next to the transit station mm -hmm. and made it for restaurants. And we just keep extending the pilot. Oh, we're still testing, collecting more data, you extend the pilot, extend the pilot um, and working to get something a little bit more formalized. Yeah. Well, I think on that note, I don't see any more questions in the chat. But I think that's a good place for us to end, mostly so that we can give you the rest of your evening back. But thank you so much. Um, we've put a link to a feedback form in the chat. So if you uh, would do us a favor and fill it out, that would be wonderful. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's program, first, we're thrilled. We love that. Uh, but second, we also uh, want to make sure you know about other ways you can get involved. Um, and the best way to do that is to sign up for our newsletter. So if you are not yet on our newsletter, you should be. And to entice you, we have uh, 10 copies of Inclusive Transportation. This is our copy, that the library's copy that we have checked out right now. It lives in our gallery for the duration of this exhibition. But we have bought 10 copies and we will be giving them away uh, to 10 lucky newsletter subscribers. So sign up and then check the newsletter that comes out on Monday for more details on how that will happen. Um, and as for other transportation related events, uh, we've sort of hinted at it this coming Friday, we're gonna be sharing our classroom with representatives from the mayor's office of new urban mechanics uh, to look at historic maps of Boylston Street. Um, and it will be part of our From the Vault series. And then in just over a week on November 1st, uh, if you're not too tired out from Halloween, you can come join us at Transit Trivia here at the Central Library. So come get your transit nerd on. And the events calendar is pretty packed between now and the end of the year. So keep an eye out for there will be something that you will enjoy. Uh, all of our virtual talks are recorded on, uh, so they will live on on YouTube as well. And I just want to thank Veronica for sharing with us. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in, especially because we had a date change in there. And I also want to thank the mobility team at the Bar Foundation for their support of our exhibition and our programming. So with that, I think we will conclude. Thank you. Good night.